procedure time. Audition. So that's all of the um, relevant info on how vision works with rods and cones and transductions. As long as you understand that, you should be in pretty good shape. Um, yeah, it is tricky to think about. <clears throat> I'm not actually seeing you. I'm just, that's my brain's perception of you. It's not actually the light or maybe even how you look. All right, audition. So let's first talk about the uh, features of the ear. Yeah, we got time because we got to 21, so we got like almost 15 minutes. So we'll do the uh, physical parts of the ear and we'll see how far we get into how it actually works. But before I explain it, the process is very similar to vision in that it's perceiving frequency of waves, but it's sound instead of light in this case. And uh, it's also activating certain um, receptor cells that send a signal to your brain. This is why sometimes if you're blind or deaf, depending on what you have, you can, your brain can actually, this is the plasticity feature of it, recruit occipital lobe or temporal lobe um, uh, neurons uh, to actually help interpret the other's information because it's a similar feature as in light waves are coming in or sound waves are coming in, it looks at the frequency and then it sends that uh, information to your brain which then tries to figure out how far away it is or isn't. So that's why as far as plasticity goes, you can actually share to some degree on those, but you can't for other ones. So like your frontal lobe, nothing to do with any of that as far as perceiving the information. So you can't use frontal lobe neurons to you know, perceive hearing or vice versa. <clears throat> All right, audition. That's terrible here. It's like an elephant here. That's more human-ish. There you go, good enough. That's an ear with a big lobe. All right. All right, so these are all out of proportion, but these are the parts. So I've got my outer ear my middle ear, and my inner ear. Uh, like I said, very similar feature here. <clears throat> my brain is taking in waves, in this case sound waves, uh, vibrations, and how I perceive the sound, like whether it sounds on the lower end or the higher end, that's the best I can do, um, <laughs> that's going to be... Uh, the reason why you can tell the difference in my voice there is actually the frequency of the waves. All right, so just like light, um, the version of a, a low pitch or a low sound would be low frequency. So my sound waves that are further apart um, than like your regular voice, like mine right now, uh, is more of like the middle. And then uh, a, a high frequency voice, like a high frequency voice, would be bigger waves like that. Well, I'm I'm partially sick, so I definitely can't go as high as I normally could. But um, I can't go very high anyway. But as far as, uh, and that's why, by the way, males and females generally have differences in uh, pitch because the size of the vocal cords is uh, thicker or thinner, which determines um, uh, the frequency of the waves. So I've got my uh, low pitch, my high pitch, and my you know middle pitch, essentially. OK. Um, so these waves are coming in, and your ear is designed to actually and shaped to capture them. That's why you can actually enhance your hearing by cupping around your ear. You can actually hear better if you do that, because it's taking the, you're all like, um, you're actually taking the shape of your ear and mimicking it to catch more sound waves. Um, so it actually does work that way. Um, this catches the waves that are coming in, right? And again, we, we do actually do care about the frequency here, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, so the capture, and they go through um, your eardrum, or sorry, ear canal, part of the middle ear, and it hits your eardrum. This is the thing you don't want to like take a, a, a Q-tip and go too far and poke, because like you'll hear a sound and followed by a lifetime of silence in that ear uh, if you break this eardrum. You could potentially have it repaired, but just don't go that far in there, man. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, you go down in the ear, and there's this eardrum. This eardrum is what is absorbing these sound waves, all right? And again, uh, the, the pitch does matter here, the frequency matters. Um, it goes through, it hits this eardrum, and uh, it causes it to vibrate, just like 
the, at the same frequency that it receives. So if it's at a frequency that's like, you know, that, like two hills inside, then it'll vibrate at that exact same frequency. If it's a high frequency like this, there's like 10, it'd be like, like 10, it'll vibrate at that exact same frequency. All right, so that's absorbing the waves, causes it to vibrate. Which moves, which is called the hammer, this is the eardrum. Absorbs the waves, <coughs> causes the hammer to move at the same frequency, which hits the anvil. And that anvil is attached to the stirrup, which is kind of like a tuning fork at the end. Stirrup. All right, those are the mechanics. So the whole point is for this part is to capture the sound wave and then mimic the vibrations. All right, so it's caught by the eardrum, which then makes the hammer hit the anvil and shakes the tuning fork. So that way it kind of takes these waves and then shakes them inside my inner ear. Are you with me so far? So the frequency that gets the stirrup, right, goes absorbed by the drum, moves the hammer, hits the anvil, and causes a frequency in the stirrup. What's the frequency of the stirrup going to be? The same as what entered or different? It's going to be the same, right? It's taking the same um, frequency. And it's hitting at this pace, which moves absorbed by the eardrum and, and, and uh, causes it to hit this anvil and shake this uh, tuning fork thing. All right. So the question is, why do I need this tuning fork thing? I could already get the sound wave. Like, why the hell do I need the tuning fork part? There's no way you could know this. But if you did happen to know, I would give you a lot of Morgan bucks. Say one more time. Why do I need this tuning fork part? Why can't I just have the sound waves come in? Wouldn't that just damage your ear? Uh, maybe. It doesn't necessarily absorb them in that he reduces them, per se. But you're right, it does a little bit. What? Is it too loud? Uh, not necessarily. Would it sound like super distorted then since it's tuning in? It wouldn't... You wouldn't hear it the same way, and, he, and here's why. Um, this stirrup is actually connected to what's called your cochlea. Cochlea. So you've heard of a cochlear implant? That's when they actually put a device in to uh, either mimic some one of these functions. So inside of it actually is a fluid that's jostled. What the stirrup does is it jostles the uh, fluid. Um, more accurately than if it was just an actual wave. So that way you have the same frequency coming in your ear and going into this fluid. And the reason why that matters is this fluid in your cochlea is going to of course vibrate and there are tiny little hairs <coughs> on the inside of your cochlea. There's also some on these, your ventricles, but that's what we'll talk about balance, we'll talk about these. So this is part of your balance. Um, this is the hearing, the cochlea part. There's little hairs on there. And these hairs act just like the um, rods and cones do. So what do rods and cones do when a, a wave comes in? And you know, for them it's light, does it sound? What do they do? They're sitting there, what do they do? Yes, they activate depending on the sound that hits them, and that's gonna send an electrochemical signal. So it's the exact same process, um, although it does look differently, obviously. So these little hairs are on the uh, uh, surface called the basilar membrane. I don't even know if you need the name of that, but I'm gonna have you guys know that because that's where the actual hairs are located. And those hairs, each hair, I'm gonna zoom in here on like a, a part of the uh, uh, cochlea. So here's the membrane. Here's the hairs sticking through. And they are attached to, on the other side, uh, these little neurons, right? Which attach to the auditory nerve, meaning the sound nerve, obviously. And that goes to your thalamus, to your brain, just like vision does. So in that sense, it's very similar because depending on the vibration I get, it activates a certain hair. Because the length of the hair, I'm not exactly sure if it's the thickness of the hair or the length of the hair, but they only vibrate or activate to certain um, wavelengths. All right, so depending on the wavelength that comes in, it's going to activate this uh, hair, which of course activates this neuron, sends an electrochemical signal, to the brain, and that tells me exactly what that sound sounds like as far as, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, how loud it is, or the pitch, like how high voiced it is, or how low voiced it is, or, or, or if it's middle, uh, whatever it might be. So it's the exact same process with different like tools. Wave comes in, only certain hairs are activated by certain waves, which then send the uh, activate and then send the electrochemical signal to my brain. 
What's that called when a wave comes in and then my body switches it to a different form of energy? Transduction. Yeah, transduction. This is the exact same process of transduction. And again, um, I want to say there's 16,000 of the hairs. There might be more. Whatever's in the notes, that's the correct number. Um, but yeah, so that's exactly how you hear. So when, whether something's uh, a certain degree of loudness, like quiet or loud, or it's a certain pitch, like low or high, um, that's going to uh, uh, determine which one of these hairs end up vibrating, which activates the neuron. So again, just like with vision, I'm not actually hearing the sound. Like, I don't even know if what, that's what that sound sounds like, but my brain is interpreting it that way because it activates those um, neurons and it sends the signal, same process. Instead of the optical nerve, it's the auditory nerve. It goes to my thalamus and my thalamus redirects it to my temporal lobes where it interprets the sound as loud or high pitched or low pitched or threatening or non-threatening or good or bad or pleasing or unpleasing, whatever it might be. Uh, that's how the process works. So what we'll pick up tomorrow is um, how your body distinguishes between loudness and pitch um, with this process. We left off on audition. <coughs> My bad ear here is really bad here. Super easy Morgan box there. That was this is first period. So that's the wrong person. Okay. Alright. Um what's this um uh area in which sound can come in through? I also get a nice amount of earwax, mm -hmm. which is nice. Not me, all of us. What's that called? That pathway. The ear canal. Ear canal, yeah. Like, I don't remember that one. I probably forgot to mention it yesterday. Awesome. So sound comes in, ear catches it, goes to my ear canal, and it hits this part, which absorbs it, and then of course matches the frequency. Ear drum. Ear drum, yep. All right. And for uh, wait, who got my canal? Ear canal. Uh, what are these three pieces, each of them? Oh. Oh, I know. I don't know the last one. All the hands are down. Um, the hammer and okay. the anvil. Which is the anvil, which... Uh, and then the stern. Yeah, which is like the tuning cord, right. So the wave comes in, hits the eardrum, which uh, makes, moves the hammer to the <coughs> frequency, which hits the anvil, which shakes this uh, uh, stirrup, which is kind of like a tuning fork, which is in uh, some liquid. Look at you for that, because it was a lot of parts. All right, cool. So that's gonna stimulate some fluid here in this snail-like looking area. Uh, what is that snail-like looking area? And then the, of course, layer of hairs on the out exterior of it. Well, technically it's the interior, but on the surface of it. Oh, the cochlea and the ventricle fluid? Yep. The cochlea, what'd you say for the uh, uh, layer? The, uh, the, the layer? Yeah, with the hairs on it? The basilar? Basilar membrane, yeah. Basilar membrane. All right, cool. Um, and then this little patchwork that goes to a part of my brain, which sends it to a part of my brain. Um, what's that little sequence of neurons going to this part of my brain? Auditory nerve. Yep, auditory nerve. What's its counterpart in the eye? The optic, nerve. optic nerve, yes, okay, cool. Auditory nerve. Like the optic nerve. And uh, what's the 90% uh, of my sensory information is directed, kind of like a traffic director, um, to various lobes of my brain, whichever ones handle the, the sense that it's, it's picking up. Um, what is that part that's receiving the information for my audition and well, all, pretty much all my other senses? Thalamus. Yeah, thalamus, sweet. And then in the case of uh, hearing, for the most part, which lobe is that information being directed to? 
mostly. Temporal? Temporal, right. Right here on the sides. Sweet. There it is. Cool. Goes to my most of it goes to my temporal lobe for interpretation. Right? That's where I perceive it. I uh, gauge the sound, if I like it or not, how loud it is or not, um, if it's a threat or not, those sorts of things. Okay, or recognize it. Um, as the sound comes in, uh, it takes the form of a wave. How do I know what, what makes a sound higher or lower? Frequency. The frequency, right. And what does that mean exactly? It's like how many hills or valleys there is. And like the more yeah, there is... Yeah, in, in a set area, right. Yeah. The more there is, it's like a higher pitch. Yep, exactly. So my, if I take this fixed area here uh, and I look at a sound wave, uh, if it's got a whole bunch in there, that'd be a high frequency. Uh, and then one with not many would be uh, a lower, or at least a lower, lower frequency. All right, cool. And that's how my uh, brain distinguishes between the two. All right, and um, we call this, by the way, like high and low. Uh, we determine the frequency, but this is called the pitch. Oops, pitch equals uh, the highness and, and lowness. Right, so uh, I'm sure you've all seen like that running joke on shows where like this lady does that, oh, super high pitch and then like glass breaks. That'd be like a really, really high frequency, a high pitch. And then a low pitch are like those baritone and bass singers that have that like, whoa, bellow. Um, I'm, a, I'm a baritone, so I can't go deeper than like a bass, but like those bass opera singers like that have those incredibly uh, resounding loud and low frequency voice, they have low pitch. <clears throat> All right, uh, so yeah, the uh, high pitch is just high frequency, low pitch is, is low frequency. Anybody know which uh, sound waves travel further and through more things, the high pitch or the low pitch? Like if I make a sound in the other room, uh, am I more likely to hear if it's a higher pitch or a lower pitch? Lower pitch actually travels further. Same with light too, by the way. Uh, if I shine like a, a uh, red light and then a yellow light and a blue light, Technically, I'd be able to see the red light from slightly further. Any reason, uh, any way we see that in everyday life? Stop lights, that's a good one, yeah. But even more uh, important than that, because these vehicles travel fast and they have to get there fast. But, okay, they are, they do have those on, so you're actually right. Uh, not so much the fact that the guys with the cones, because those are kind of orange, but um, because you're getting close regardless. But all of the poles that are really high up that have to have lights so planes don't hit them, they're not yellow light or blue light, they're red light for that exact reason. They'll, they'll see it from a further distance. But uh, emergency vehicles, I realize they also throw in the blue so you can distinguish that it's emergency because it's got the two lights, but the red one specifically travels the furthest so you can technically see it from the furthest away. All right, um, so yeah, uh, that's the frequency, it comes in. And uh, I think where we left off, if I'm not mistaken, is, is how my brain distinguishes between the two, right? With the hairs. Um, well, first of all, before I even get into the, uh, which frequency it is, how does my brain actually catch and interpret these waves that come in? They vibrate these things, which stir up the fluids, so then explain to me from there. So um, in the past, I'm there's different uh, receptor hairs and cells that are connected to neurons. Mm -hmm. And so um, the different hairs are like, I think you said they're different lengths. So they pick up different uh, frequencies, and so when that when nerves are triggered or activated, it activates uh, neurons that are connected to them individually that send neurochemical signals. Exactly, it's exactly like the eye. I mean, the, the actual cells are different, but the concept's the same. A wave comes in. My body picks up only specific waves, um, which is why you can only hear certain sounds. That's why you can blow a dog whistle and you don't hear it. You don't have hairs that are activated by that frequency. The dogs do. That's why they bark and go crazy for it, and you're like, I don't hear anything or bats too. Bats are, are flying around, finding insects at night. Um, you can kind of hear their mouths, but you can't actually hear the frequency they're using, or whales, for example, or dolphins. They're putting out frequencies uh, that we don't have hairs for. They don't react to that, to that frequency. But the dolphins, or whales, or dogs, or you know, other animals, bats, the, theirs do uh, receive that signal. They are stimulated and send the signal and they hear it. We don't, though. We actually, oh, I should play you guys the, the the twin noise, see if you guys hear it. I don't know, no. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm not gonna pull Pangbird in here though, because there's a, there's a thing I've done in a couple years in a row that, well, I'll tell it to you in a second. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, 
No, I always do it too. He, and he knows it now. I can't, I can't keep doing it. So anyways, uh, it only works since he's in his 50s now. But anyways, um, I'll explain why. No, there's a reason. It's not, I'm not ripping on his age. Uh, but anyways, so these hairs, of course, are going to uh, be stimulated by certain frequencies, depending on the location or frequency. We'll talk about the difference. Uh, and they're connected to neurons. So if that uh, particular hair is stimulated, it sends a signal to that specific neuron, which sends a signal to your throughout your nerve, to the thalamus, to your temporal lobe, and you pick up and you hear that sound. All right, and that's what how you distinguish between the frequencies. And again, that's why animals can hear sounds that you can't, because you don't have the hairs that pick up that frequency and, and tell your brain. You're still being hit by the waves, it's just your body has no way of interpreting them, well, catching them, sensing them, and then interpreting them. Okay, um, so there's two theories as to how we differentiate between these pitches. Uh, there's one that's called frequency theory. This one's simple enough. Uh, this one believes that, possibly, your neurons fire at the exact same rate that the waves are stimulating your um, uh, uh, hairs, the, 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 the receptor cells. All right, so uh, frequency of neural firings matches um, wave frequency of the sound. That you like, I don't know what that means. Here's what it means. Let's say you have a low frequency sound come in and, it, and this is the frequency of the wave, like this. All right? What that would mean is your neurons are gonna fire at that exact same uh, rate. So if, if the frequency is this, then your neurons are gonna fire to your brain at this rate. So that way you can actually tell exactly what the frequency is. All right, and there's some merit to this theory. There's another theory though called place theory. And that one believes that certain areas have hairs that are only activated by that specific frequency. All right, so if a, if a high frequency come, thing comes in, the hairs in this spot might be too thick or long to catch it, so they're not activated, but the ones over here are just the right length and thickness to catch the uh, uh, frequency, the high pitch. And so these are all stimulated, which tells your brain, oh, if I'm only stimulated here in my high frequency uh, um, uh, receptor cells, what does my brain know about the sound? Is it low frequency? No, because that would mean these might be stimulated. Since these are stimulated sending a message, that's just like only a blue um, cone being activated or only a red cone being activated in my eye. Um, if these are activated and they're only high frequency, my brain knows that it's high frequency. All right, so place theory means uh, only certain fibers slash areas are stimulated by specific frequencies. I'm not exactly sure on all the details as to how they know both of these can both be true or, or partially be true, like I do with the uh, vision part. But um, they both have merit, because otherwise one would just overcome the other, they would test for it. So likely there's good evidence for both of these that your neurons match the frequency firing, and also only certain areas can be activated by certain frequencies. Okay, so if this is the high frequency area, for example, and a low frequency sound comes in, are these neurons gonna activate? No, they're not. Only the low frequency ones would activate. So then my brain knows, oh, that's a low sound, a deep sound, as opposed to a high pitched uh, sound. All right, do we understand the difference between the theories? What do I mean by this neuron firing matching the frequency thing? Somebody tell it to me. So like the frequency theory? Mm -hmm. So um, <coughs> the nerves are all connected to neurons, and so when you pick up like a frequency of a sound, the neurons are gonna fire um, at that same rate. So if you like knock like three times, like yeah. you did, then your neurons are gonna like active, or not like activate, but like fire at that same pace or rate. Yep, so that way I would know the frequency exactly. What about place theory? Who's got that one? Like, so like, you know, like the little stringy thingies? <clears throat> yeah. Some parts of it can hear that type of frequency. Yeah. So if it's high, only that part will, that only that part will activate, but the others will not. Yep, exactly. If it's low, that one wouldn't be another, be another part. Exactly. Good. Sounds like you guys got those. So I think that's all we have to know for hearing and vision other than the uh, how to lose them. That slide that talks about feature receptors, uh, in all that, uh, I'm going to save that for perception. And I don't even know why they have that because it's definitely perception because it's talking about um, how you're reading the information based on distance and dimension. So I'm going to save that for next week. Um, 
But this step uh, we can talk about, oh, I, I actually skipped one thing, loudness. Um, what makes a sound louder or quieter isn't the frequency, all right? So the frequency, the amount of waves are gonna be exactly the same. It's how high and low those waves and valleys are, all right? So if I take a low frequency, it's gonna have these two um, hills and valleys, but if it's a louder sound, there's more energy, so they, there'll be bigger waves. So let's say this is, for example, a medium sound, a low frequency medium sound. A loud one would look like this. So it's still gonna have just two, uh, one hill and one valley, but it's gonna look like this. Is that the same frequency? Yeah. Yes, so I've got one hill and one valley, correct? And I, and I've started one over here. But what's the difference again? It's louder. I know, but how do I know it's louder? Yeah, the peaks and valleys are higher. Uh, there's more distance between them. That's what determines how loud it is. All right, so the bigger the wave, as far as the uh, peaks and the valleys height goes, that means it's louder. So a quiet low frequency would be something like this. You notice the difference? Yeah, this one is got two still, or, or, or one of each, uh, but the uh, hills and valleys are definitely shorter, which means it's a softer sound. All right, so we call that amplitude. So amplitude, which basically means the height of the waves or valleys, uh, is loudness. Uh, can I hear something so loud that it uh, actually breaks my uh, uh, ability to hear, damages my eardrums and whatnot? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so zero decibels, we measure it, by the way, in decibels, not decibels, decibels. That's zero sound. That's me not picking up anything. Uh, it goes in increments of 10, and I think actually, by the way, it increases exponentially. So like, this is 10, a factor of 10, but then when I go to 20 decibels, it's actually 10 times 10, which would be 100. So it keeps going up, I think, uh, just like that. And the point to where if you're hearing a sound at this decibel level, this loudness, um, obviously the higher the number, the louder, uh, you would actually experience um, ear damage over time is 85 decibels. It's actually not that loud, unfortunately. Uh, most of you that listen to headphones are probably at or slightly above that duration. Uh, if you go to a rock concert, or you, even you go to a football game, and all this is fans cheering, that can be uh, around 100. And if you're by speakers in a bar uh, or a, um, you guys aren't gonna go to a bar anytime soon, but uh, if you're going to a place like that, eventually in life, you're gonna find that they blast that music and it is definitely above 100 decibels. So if you stay there continuously, uh, it, it will damage your ears over time. When that means you will hear either less, a smaller range of frequencies, or it means that you will constantly hear a ringing, which is even more annoying. Uh, same thing can happen for heavy machinery. So um, places that can go beyond uh, these decibels, your own headphones can. Anytime you hear those guys thinking they're like the coolest thing on earth because they're blasting their music in their car, you shoot that and they drive down the road. I've hated this since I was a kid. Um, they do that and I've sat in the cars with them and you can't even hear them talk because the music's so loud. That's definitely um, uh, damaging the ears over time. So uh, even speakers and cars can do this. Um, stadiums, concerts, can. Obviously, the closer you are to the speakers, the worse it's going to be. Um, uh, how can I phrase this? Uh, club type places, like small places, maybe like a bar that has loud music where people dance and drink and things like that, those definitely go over that. Obviously, you're not going to be in there anytime soon, but eventually in your life you will. Uh, and those are going to be quite loud, loud, so any sort of club. Um, another one that's surprising is uh, heavy machinery. So if I work with power tools, almost all power tools, not necessarily drills, but if I'm using saws or jackhammers or something like that, almost all of those are above 85 decibels. So if you end up joining the trades and you're working on houses or floors or cars or you're a road worker or whatever, using a jackhammer, um, they usually require you to wear earplugs anyway, but you have to, otherwise you will absolutely damage your hearing over time to the point that you can't hear certain sounds anymore or you hear a constant ringing and have headaches uh, guns, way over 100 decibels. So that's why when you go to gun ranges, you're in the military, they have you wear the earplugs because you will permanently damage your hearing.
from constantly hearing that sound uh, that's way above 85 decibels. So, uh, yeah, guns are another one that can take it above that. So if you're doing any of these activities, uh, always use ear protection. You don't have to, but I would recommend it because you will actually damage your hearing. And what I mean by damaging your hearing is you will hear less sounds, less range of sounds, so you won't hear certain pitches anymore, or even more annoyingly, you'll have that ringing in your ear, which can block out other sounds, which sucks. Any questions about ear damage and all that? Okay, here's what I meant about Mr. Pangberg. Not that he's done this stuff and lost his hearing. Um, he's on the other side of 50. And as you grow in age, you do slowly lose your range of frequency. Uh, I'm not sure the exact reason whether you're damaging your ear over time or these hair uh, neurons are just no longer working. But humans can normally hear a certain decibel range uh, and a certain frequency range. Um, you peak in your late teens, you guys are about there. Uh, you can hear roughly the widest range of frequency. And then starting your 20s, very slowly you start losing that range. So technically, I'm 32 and most of you guys are in your mid to late teens, mid teens. Um, there's almost certainly a couple frequencies you guys can hear that I can't hear anymore. Uh, there's probably not many, because again, I'm on the, the younger end. It really, it really drops off when you hit your 40s and 50s. Um, but what I did the last couple years, uh, when Mr. Pangram had a prep and I had psych class, is I'd ask him to come in and we'd be playing a frequency that everyone could hear. It'd be like this sound, and we can all hear it, and we'd bring him in, and he'd have no idea. He would just be back there, and it's like, it, it seems like it's impossible. It's like, no, what? How are you not hearing this blaring sound that's going on? But he can't hear the frequency anymore, because the uh, uh, hairs don't go off. And I mean, I may not be able to hear that sound anymore. They, they call it the tween sound. Uh, where the teens and 20s can hear it, but 30s, 40s, 50s usually can't. Um, but yeah, it, it's an interesting one. So uh, you control your parents with that one too. Um, I, <laughs> when I found out about it, I was uh, just out of high school and I was playing the sound of my computer. I was like, hey mom, can you hear this? And she came in, she couldn't hear it or whatever. My dad came in and he thought I was, he thought I was like joking it. Like he was pranks, like there's no sound. I was like, no, listen, there's a sound. Like, I, I play it and I hear it and I called my brother and he could hear it and all that. And he didn't believe us. Uh, and <laughs> it's just like, no, I'll show you. I'll show you. Like, look, I'll turn around and you can hit start and stop and I'll, I'll put on my thumb when I hear it or not. And he's doing that. He's like, you're just hearing me click the keyboard. So he didn't believe me. And he went in the other room. He was so pissed. He went in the other room and like turned the speaker up to max and put his ear right up next to it, <laughs> trying to hear it. And he, he, uh, he believes me now. But uh, he, didn't, he didn't believe me. He was so upset that he couldn't hear this, uh, this frequency. It's like, man, it happens. I won't be able to hear it eventually either. But uh, I could at the time anyway. So yeah, uh, you can do that. And sometimes um, student, no, I'm not going to tell you what students do. Uh, because. I don't want you doing it to the teachers. So um, let's just leave that as a side note. And um, that's how frequency works. So any questions except for how to do the thing that I was going to talk about? OK. Let's move on then <laughs> to uh, losing hearing or vision. So oh, I should have kept this up here. Actually, I'm going to keep it up here. I need this for a movement, or not movement, uh, body sense. I don't need the rest of it though. It's all blind or um, Ways I can lose or experience sensory disorders, as they're called. Sensory disorders. This isn't all of them, by the way, but this is some of the basic ones. So for hearing, I can be either blind completely or colorblind to one or two colors, or all hearing. colors. I can what, did I write hearing somewhere? No, you said for hearing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, for vision. Yes, uh, for vision, it would be blindness or color blindness. Um, so, I'll ask you guys: What are some possible causes of this blindness that I might have, aside from the fact that, like, I lost an eye or my eye got damaged by something? Because obviously, that could do it. I mean, like, if I'm born with it, uh, what what might be wrong? Like, if you're born without uh, one of the three cones like activating, you can be color blind. Yeah. Okay, so my, I could be uh, inherit genes that don't uh, code properly, and then I, my uh, color cones aren't there, or they don't operate properly, like they, don't, they aren't um, activated by the light that they're supposed to be, the frequency. All right, that would be an explanation. What about total blindness? And again, pretend my eye is there still. What could be going on? What could the error or errors possibly be? Are your lenses not developed so you can't focus in on it? You would still get light. I'm talking about seeing nothing. 
Okay. Yeah, even if if you're if it was an issue with the lens, not focusing the light, you would still see something. You would see light, just be blurry. All right, so someone's totally blind. Would the structure of the eye be damaged? Um, again, it'd be more along the lines of what she was saying. I would still probably be getting light. It just wouldn't be uh, clear enough to really use. I'm talking to people that see no light at all, just totally blind, nothing. Is it like <clears> the light doesn't travel right to the fovea? That's what they're saying too. So again, it's not about the lens, okay? I'm not even receiving the light signal at all. What isn't functioning properly? And the, okay, that could be the problem. My cones and rods, uh, you know, again, it could have been inherited a gene that screwed up on my production of rods and cones, and either they're not there or they're not working. That would be one, right? Because that way, even if a light beam comes in, if my rods and cones aren't working, they're never activated, I never get the signal to my brain. That could be it. What else could be it? So my rods and or cones could be damaged or not there. What else could there be? That, I mean, that's not there or not functioning properly. We already got that. Rods and cones, check. Not there or damaged or not functioning properly. What else could be the problem? The damage to the retina. Okay, so that would be pretty much the rod cone thing because that's where they are. But yeah, okay. Think beyond the rods and the cones. Is that the only thing? As soon as that rod and that cone are activated, I automatically see the thing? Like, that's not how it works. What about the nerve itself? Yes, okay, so any part of that optic nerve could be damaged or not working properly, yeah. Any of the ganglion cells, any of the bipolar cells that go between the rods and cones to the ganglion, which is the, the parts that get to the optic nerve, okay. So my bipolar cells could be misfunctioning. So even, even if my rods and cones are activating, if my bipolar cells aren't functioning, they never get the message on to my optic nerve and never gets to my brain. So it could be damage uh, or problems with my bipolar cells, my ganglion and optic nerve, cells, uh, or I could possibly have damage to my, what other parts could I have damage to or not be functioning properly along that chain? So remember, rods and cones activated, send a signal through the bipolar to the ganglion, optic nerve, any of those could be damaged. Where does it go to? So the yeah, thalamus could be an error in the thalamus, right? Could be directing it to the wrong part of my brain, which can't, in, you know, uh, decode the information or it's not going at all. And then what's the lobe that handles my perception of, of vision? Uh, yeah, any of those could be, there could be an error in any of those parts. Um, it's much more likely that it's a rod and cone issue like you guys astutely suggested, uh, but it could be any of those technically uh, problem anywhere there. <clears throat> All right, so those are my explanations for blindness, which is why, generally speaking, you can't fix blindness if you're born with it. If, you're, if it's a damage to the eye tissue uh, and it's not like a cone, uh, rod issue, possibly w with surgery and, and all that. But if my uh, if my nerves are damaged in any way or not functioning, we can't fix or replace the nerves. So that's just that's just it, unfortunately. Uh, if you're born with uh, these conditions, so far as I know, anyway, we have not figured out how to go in and repair the millions of neurons that are that may be misfiring or, or not functioning properly. <clears throat> okay, auditory disorders. Yeah, auditory. So this is blindness. So vision. Auditory disorders. I've got two kinds of deafness. Uh, and deafness can be, I don't hear a wide enough a range of sounds, or I don't hear any sounds. All right, so it can be very, very limited sound capability, or none. So uh, deafness could be sensory neural. Sensory neural. Deafness. Or conductive, I think it's called. Deafness. All right, here's the difference between the two. He's like, well, they're both deafness. What's the difference? Here's the difference. This is the one that you can sometimes fix. This means that the error, I guess I do need this part, actually. The error is with this physical, mechanical part of the brain. It's not the brain, the ear. So on my middle ear, and partly in the ear, I've got my eardrum, hammer, anvil, and stirrup. If those are damaged, or not functioning properly, uh, then my, the vibrations are not getting to this tuning fork part and they're not getting into my cochlea. So that's the issue uh, if I'm having experiencing conductive hearing loss uh, or deafness. All right, That could potentially be fixed, maybe. 
all right? Cochlear implants can uh, mimic this, where they basically put something uh, into your, uh, where your eardrum would be or is, that does this function, that receives the waves and sort of uh, spins a tuning fork, and that uh, makes this actually work again. So as long as you're getting those uh, uh, vibrations into the cochlea, it should work, which is why some people could have those implants and actually make it work if the problem is here on the mechanical part, all right? What can I probably not fix if it's broken though? What? The membrane? The membrane? Oh, okay, so yeah, the parts that deal with the neurons, those, so far as I know, we cannot fix. Uh, because again, just like with the rods and the cones, we can't go in and uh, change your DNA and fix all those individual neurons that are not working. So, if I have, and again, this is mechanical, so largely the middle ear part, uh, the sensory neural is going to be uh, dealing with the neurons in the inner ear. And if these aren't functioning properly for whatever reason, whether it's if I zoom in here and you've got the hairs that activate the neuron, which sends the signal to the optory nerve, if any part of this transition is not working, this neuron doesn't activate when the hair uh, uh, wiggles or the hair uh, is improperly sized so it doesn't catch the right sounds, or somehow these neurons. Uh, are not connected, or the thalamus is not directing it properly to your temporal lobe, or your temporal lobe is not interpreting it correctly. Any of those are wrong, we can't go in and fix those. They're not mechanical. They are on the cellular level, and the cells are not working themselves, and we, we can't do it. That's why when neurons die, when you have brain cell deaths like Pulsari, those are just gone. We can't actually replace those. So if those aren't functioning, then that's the kind of deafness or hearing loss that you uh, likely will not ever um, get back or experience that we can't fix essentially. So th th does the two, does the difference between the two make sense? All right, so this is mechanical, we can fix it. It's just like a moving or not moving sensation, but if you go down the neural level and there's neurons not firing or not interpreting correctly, that one we, we, we can't actually fix, at least not yet. <clears throat> All right, last one. They just added this one. Um, what was it called? Synesthesia, thank you, yeah. This is a weird one. This is an interpretation error. So this is an error either uh, in the thalamus is sending it to the wrong location or the lobe is interpreting it incorrectly. This is where people experience other senses when one sense is received. So let's say for example, I hear a sound. I think the example I gave is the example from um, uh, uh, the textbook. It was, uh, this is the trumpet red thing? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So when this guy hears a trumpet, for whatever reason, the frequency comes in, whatever frequency it is, the note, it comes in, everything works normally, the frequency goes through, stimulates the hairs, hairs go through the auditory nerve. Somewhere in the thalamus or the temporal lobe or the sensory uh, neural uh, lobe, the lobe that uh, dictates your senses, there's an error there somewhere because it's actually registering as not just the sound but also the color red. So he'll see the color red even though he's hearing a trumpet sound. So the error is somewhere in his perception. Uh, it is in the, um, uh, perhaps maybe on the auditory nerve, but I doubt it. It's almost certainly a problem with the thalamus directing it to the wrong area of the brain or the temporal lobe uh, interpreting it at least partly with uh, uh, the part that uh, deals with um, occipital uh, features. So um, perhaps maybe, so this is your occipital lobe, Perhaps maybe the thalamus is accidentally directing part or all of it to the uh, vision and that he's experiencing red for whatever reason, or um, there's some sort of intermingling or disturbance between the two because they're actually next to each other um, and that's why he's perceiving it incorrectly. Or not even incorrectly, just in addition to the trumpet sound. All right, and that can happen with anything. So that you could touch something maybe. I'm actually not sure if it's specific, if it has to just be audition and vision because the two are, are so similar because you're in both cases like I've told you guys before it's dealing with like distance and depth and, and um, uh, wavelength uh, coming in but uh, yeah you're, you're experiencing the other thing so you would uh, maybe see something and hear a sound or hear a sound and see something uh, it's kind of improperly perceiving uh, the sensory information does that make sense so where's the error in, syn in synesthesia, when I experience a different sensation, 
I hear a sound and see something, or I see something and hear a sound. Well, where's the error? It could be in the thousand seconds of the long code. Or? Or it could be like intermediate between the temporal. Yeah, exactly. It's a perception error, right? It's not a sensation error. I'm still getting the sensation. Like, it's registering to my brain, but my brain has misguided it or it's misinterpreting it. Uh, like I said, thalamus misdirection, perhaps, or a, a misinterpretation between the occipital and temporal lobes. All right. So, that's what that one is. I believe, so far as I know, it's super rare. Um, and it doesn't sound like, for the most part, it would be like, make your life particularly more difficult, but uh, it's a weird one. And that's just one of the many ways your brain can screw up because it's so insanely complicated and it's a whole bunch of different networks and circuits and modules that interact. Um, so it's really easy to screw up. All right. You guys understand the uh, sensory disorders? All right. <clears throat> So, uh, how could I be colorblind or blind? If you don't have the cones for the type of color, you won't be able to see it. Like, if you don't have red cones. Okay, if they're not there, they're not working. Absolutely. How else could I be colorblind or blind? Um, if you have problems with your bipolar and gain on cells and you're, like, not functioning enough. Function. Okay, yeah. So, any of the uh, transmission cells are, are not functioning correctly? Absolutely. All right. Um, also, the rods, too, don't forget those that have to do with the lightness and darkness and uh, peripheral vision. If they aren't working, I'm not going to see properly either. All right, cool. Uh, what about um, sensory neural hearing loss uh, or deafness? How would that work? Oh, well, actually, yeah. Yeah. Um, like, when you, your receptor hairs is, like, not functioning correctly, like, you can't, like, receive the Okay, so where's the problem then? What part of the ear? Um, the okay, and then uh, it might have to do with the hair, okay, or what part is the hair attached to and how does the message go? You did try. All right, it could do, but like you just told me my like, hair's not working. But wait, what, my hair? It's not working? I don't understand. Um, Words. <laughs> Who can, who can explain this one? Is it damage to the eardrum right? or the bassoon? Um, for sensory neuro, uh, neural? Um, yeah, it wouldn't be eardrum focused in this case. If like the neurons aren't being fired to like the frequency? Yeah, if, uh, if the, uh, and it could have to do with the hairs potentially, but if the hair isn't catching the frequency or the neuron when the hair uh, vibrates isn't activated, it never even sends the signal, to perceive the sound at all. Or I could have a, a problem with an auditory nerve uh, or my thalamus uh, or a low temporal lobe. Okay, cool, cool. And then um, what about conductive hearing loss or deafness? That's like mechanical damage to the eardrum, so any, and most of the time it can be fixed because it's something wrong with like the hammer or something like that, where it's not sending the frequencies to the brain. Yeah, there we go. I don't know if most of the time it can be fixed, but it can be fixed, whereas if my neurons are somehow misfiring, uh, or not working as far as I know we can't fix that one all right mm -hmm. well done and uh, synesthesia what is that and what's going on there uh, you're still getting the, the sensation but you're just perceiving it correctly so it could be the thalamus that's sending the, the information to the wrong lobe or it could be the temporal lobe and the lobe, like pinch and mingling okay well done could be uh uh, thalamus is missending it or the lobes are somehow uh, misinterpreting the information. Nice, cool. 